This is the Voyage Report podcast, where you get the scoop on travel. Now, the editor-in-chief of the Voyage Report, Mark Albert. Greetings, fellow travelers, and welcome. Today, we're going to talk about how to stay safe in this uncertain political and security climate as you travel in other countries, especially now that the State Department has just reissued its worldwide caution for travelers. Our guest is Cheryl Hill, founder and executive director of Depart Smart, the only nonprofit working to reach, teach, and engage travelers as active participants in their health and safety while they're abroad. She's joining us today via Skype from the group's headquarters in St. Louis Park, Minnesota. Cheryl, welcome to the Voyage Report podcast. My pleasure. Thank you for having us. So why don't you start by telling us just a little bit about Depart Smart and its mission? Uh, That's one of my passions. Uh, Depart Smart was founded after angst when my son, Tyler Hill, died a preventable death in Japan. And we learned through a parent's worst nightmare that his story repeats again and again. There's no travel and tourism consumer safety. We don't get warnings before we buy or fly. So our mission is to save lives by helping people build skills to identify and avoid risk at help and home. And our vision is to become the world leader, the world trusted expert in consumer-driven travel safety skills. And when you say it was preventable, what do you mean? Tyler um, became severely ill after a hike on a hot day at Mount Fuji. He was given a one bottle of water. Um, he reported ill. Um, There is evidence that his teacher chaperones were having an alcohol party and that they told Tyler to go back to his room. Uh, Pat Bam Smith, who is a leader on his tour, denied that Tyler asked for medical attention. But Dr. Yagi testified that he was told that Tyler asked for medical attention. And I know my son. Um, He died literally minutes away from the Japanese Red Cross Hospital. He tried to dial 911 when he did not get the help he needed. And the number in Japan is 119. So if Tyler would have received medical attention for severe dehydration from excessive vomiting, he would be alive today. And you mentioned testified, and that's because there was a a court case. You sued People to People, uh, which was the organization that your son was with um, after that student ambassador trip in 2008, um, and you settled with them in 2009. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. And as you mentioned, in a statement to uh, the Seattle Times in 2009, People to People denied your family's allegations uh, that he was left alone. And as you just mentioned, uh, they claimed that he refused medical attention. Um, But now it's become your mission um, to make sure that doesn't happen to another family. Exactly. And I think there were there's just so much that and and they're rudimentary things that in hindsight, um, you look at them and say, why didn't we know that? Why didn't I know about the validity rule? My passport was not good for six months beyond Tyler's return date. And so I was um, almost denied flight to retrieve him um, in 2007. It's something that every person who has a loved one um uh, on foreign soil should do is make sure that their passport is good for six months beyond the return date of their loved one. And But just even knowing the emergency number and how to ask for help or where the United States Embassy is, how to reach your consulate, there's so much that we need to know to have safe, rewarding journeys and to get the help we need wherever we are. Cheryl, for those uh, who want to learn more about Tyler, we want to let our listeners know that there is a website, tylerhill.org, with a picture gallery and videos. He was 16. Tell us more about him. <laughs> That's my favorite subject. <laughs> I'm often asked uh, how he died, and I would much rather tell you how he lived. Um, Tyler was barely 16. He had just gotten his driver's license a week before he left. His birthday is June 6th, D-Day. And he was an amazing history buff. He loved history. From the time that he could walk, he was playing with little green army guys. And he loved the History Channel. In fact, uh, he was an AP history, advanced history. um, He was awarded recognition at his school for stellar student in advanced history. His teacher said that he's the kind of kid you never wanted to call on because he would know more than you. Um, He was a big kid. Um, six foot two and 215 to 30 pounds, depending on which sport he was playing. He loved football. He loved hockey. They called him in rugby. Um, they called him the beast with the heart because um, if he checked you and you didn't get up quickly, he would be the first one over offering you a hand and 
um, trying to be helpful. Um, he was a hero at his school for single-handedly reporting a bomb threat. Um, he told me that he wasn't a hero because he was afraid. And I said, you know, Ty, you did the right thing anyway. Lots of people are afraid and don't do the right thing. So we celebrate him as a hero. Um, he loved Spanish. Um, he was the kind of kid that didn't think it was cool to be cool. And his school remembered him in that way. They came in front of our house with some banners that said it's not cool to be cool to remember him a year after he died. So Tyler left um, an impression on a lot of hearts. And when our best and brightest die on study abroad programs, we lose their future. And of course, especially during the holiday seasons, you always wonder who he would be now at 26 years old. But when we published TylerHill.org, we did that because the teachers that were on Tyler trip, Tyler's trip that were responsible for his safety were on a trip years prior where Ian Phillips also died. So now they have two deaths under the careful guidance of these teachers. And we felt it our responsibility to warn the public not to trust their children on a tour abroad with that faculty. And when we published TylerHill.org, we heard from thousands of families whose students were abandoned, abused, raped, um, assaulted, and killed on study abroad programs. And there's no jurisdiction, no Department of the United States, not the Department of Ed, not the Department of State or Justice or Commerce has any jurisdiction over study abroad or travel safety. Policy simply hasn't kept pace with globalization. So if you're sold a tour that is head them up, move it out, rake it in, and you become victimized because you were placed in the wrong side of the tracks and somebody overcharged you, it's really difficult to um, get any kind of vindication over what happened. Um, in the lawsuit, Judge Porter amended our complaint with punitive damages. Punitive damages are amended to a wrongful death or personal injury lawsuit when reasonable people would find the evidence highly offensive. And yes, we did settle out of court. But I think that Judge Porter and his ruling um, kind of made that happen. Cheryl, thank you for sharing uh, part of Tyler with us on this podcast. I think a lot of the listeners here um, had it happened to them, they may be absolutely within their rights to say, I don't want to go public. I don't want to uh, do such a, uh, a public sharing of my story. And that would certainly be within their rights. Uh, why is it important for you, though, to be so vocal about this? Not everyone starts an organization. No, that's true. I, I get asked that a lot. Um, in fact, the Minneapolis Star and Tribune did a story specifically around that topic. And I guess it turns out that it's in my DNA. Since the time I was a little girl, I've always been a helper. You know, I've been a, I was a helper in early childhood family education and in Title IX and um, in diabetes management. I've always been someone who likes to help. And I think that uh, the death of Ian Phillips probably weighted heavy on my heart because if I would have known in advance that those teachers had a death on a prior trip, I would have never sent Tyler on a trip with them. And I would say that the greatest reward for me and for the people that support us, and we have hundreds, are that we couldn't help Tyler. But I get calls all the time that from the public that say things like, you saved my son's life in Costa Rica, or you saved my husband's life in Belize. And technically, I suppose that there's a soft yes in there, but the the real answer is I wasn't there, but I showed you how to do it. And the greatest reward is when you know that you've saved a life. There is um, there is no greater treasure. Cheryl, you're absolutely to be commended uh, for doing that. And I would imagine there's no greater gratitude um, than when you feel as though you've saved somebody else's life or given a warning to a family that has uh, kept them from some unfortunate uh, circumstance. Um, you did mention that there are no laws uh, or even a requirement for trans uh, transparent reporting on the safety records of these companies and colleges that take teen groups overseas by some estimates that I've read. It's a $17 billion private industry, more than a quarter million students participating 
each year. I guess you believe that has to change, right? Greater transparency? I think that 17 billion number is a decade old, and we're in hundreds of billions now. <laughs> so wow. this is a $7 trillion industry. And when we first um, started our nonprofit, it was by Congressman Ramstead's advice. He said we needed to build a coalition and start an army of parents who suffered um, like we did uh, so that we could move transparency laws. Um, we met President Obama in 2013, and we worked with the White House Office of Public Engagement, who told me candidly that legislation stinks. And I said, what really stinks is when your son dies a preventable death and no one does anything about it. And so we pushed really hard uh, for some federal rules. There was a bill introduced by Congressman Maloney that's never moved forward. He's reintroducing it again this year. And we did move laws in Minnesota. There is the Thomas Plotkin Higher Education Study Abroad Safety Law and the Tyler Hill K-12 Transparency Law for Study Abroad and a law in Virginia in honor of Damian Wilkins. Um, but the Office of Public Engagement was right. Um, legislation stinks. And the reason it stinks is that anybody will look for a loophole not to report on their program um, for an example, the law in Minnesota, we know we know that rape and sexual assault of students abroad is the number one crime against our um, our children going abroad, and yet there's there's never a rape reported on any of the study abroad in the state of Minnesota because there is a I guess a definition that says that you have to be hospitalized. And hospitalized by interpretation could mean you have to spend the night, not that you were admitted. So um we were kind of encouraged by departments of the United States government to create a private solution to a very public problem, and that is travel safety literacy. And when we were moving laws, we created a database that we called ISAD. It is the Incomplete Illness, Injury, Student Abroad Death Report. And there are hundreds of tragic stories like Tyler's. And you learn things. You learn that our kids don't know what a flag on a beach means. They don't know how to identify rip currents. They don't. Uh, they go on to dangerous beaches. They fall out of windows and balconies that are not to OSHA standard because they're in another country. Um, they go on gap weekends after their program when they're not insured, and you know things happen. And so we took the data from the inter uh, ISAD database, and we came up with. Um, some questions for the families. What do you know now that you didn't know then that could have changed the outcome of that tragedy? And we created a 10 point quiz that we call the travel safety savvy quiz because the history repeats, his story repeats again and again. And from the travel safety savvy quiz, we came up with a checklist that we did, we did promote for a while, but we turned that into a course because what we found was when people um, had it, they, were, they had a million questions, and I would spend hours on the phone trying to walk them to the how and the why and the importance and relevance of the list. And now we have a one-hour, it's a six mini courses on country-specific information, registering your trip at your foreign affairs office, health and wellness, geography and housing, money and security and communications. Each micro lesson takes about 10 minutes. It's fun and engaging with animations and games, and you walk away with a personalized travel safety plan for your destination so that you can identify and avoid risks, get help and home, and your emergency contacts are ready to help if needed. And it is probably the, uh, we're hearing it's overwhelmingly comprehensive and that people want us to come now with more, like um, water safety and food safety and sexual assault and um, even just knowing what countries have Napoleon's law where you're guilty until proven innocent can be a life-saving thing. So it's very rewarding uh, to be on this side of the problem, helping people really define what a safe journey is and to travel safely for a lifetime. We love to travel. Uh, we still have many countries on our bucket list. And that travel safety course, uh, listeners, is 60 minutes long, um, as Cheryl mentioned, and it covers uh, simple questions that, that seem simple when you hear, but you may never have discussed with your family. For example, do you have an evacuation plan to get your family back home safely uh, if your son or daughter experiences an assault or serious injury or illness? Uh, will they know, not you, will they know where to go and how to get help on their own? Uh, so definitely you would want to check out that travel safety course 
Um, Cheryl, you mentioned a moment ago, Congressman Maloney, that Sean Maloney of New York. Also, I think you've reached out to Minnesota's senior senator, Amy Klobuchar. Are you frustrated, though, that all these years later, uh, there is no federal legislation? Oh, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> but again, I would say uh, where I where I really think it should be. And I, again, I think the goal is to make travel awesome. We want travel. It does create peace through understanding and it tears down walls and barriers. I'm a host mom of eight kids for more than 12 years. I have loved ones all over the world from South Africa to Chile to Japan to Finland and France and Sweden, and I strongly recommend travel. I don't want in any way for anyone to get the feeling that I'm not sad Tyler went to Japan. I'm sad he didn't know how to get the help he needed. And um, there should be, you know, even this travel ban right now, everyone's kind of going nuts over the whole screening and uh, President Trump's initiatives on screenings and there's a travel ban in Korea and in Venezuela, but you can go online right now and book a trip and no one that sells you that ticket has any responsibility or duty to inform that there is a travel ban by the United States government to those countries because of civil war and the probability that there's you're not going to get help in a country where we have no diplomatic presence like North Korea um, and how many Americans have been imprisoned and like out of warm beer, the whole story around that. So that whole awareness part, I really, um, if you have any listeners that are in the travel industry, this is what I believe. That first industry, whether it could be Travelocity or Expedia or Delta Airlines, or we have the first one, which was AIG Travel. AIG Travel invested in Depart Smart to help build this course. That company, gets awards again and again for consumer um, support. And when you are a company that is transparent and you don't filter information that people need to know, you build trust. And we call those companies firms of endearment. And we're calling on your listeners to be firms of endearment with us to make their employees a priority. We know companies do a remarkable job of safety and security for business travelers abroad. In the United States, there's about, um, it, it vacillates, but somewhere between 65 and 80 million American citizens that go abroad every year. Only 10 million of those are business travelers. The other 60 to 70 million are vacation and leisure travelers. And what I know, and I think we should go through the 10-point travel safety savvy quiz, is that the majority of them cannot pass that quiz. I know because I've given that quiz to thousands of people. It's because no one's done the homework that we've done or done the deep dive on the pain points to try to resolve what you need to know to have safe, rewarding journeys. These are habits like driving a car, right? You know you have insurance. You know what to do in an accident. You know what a safe vehicle is. You know um, the warnings on the road. You know to use your seat, your seat belt, and you know who to call when something happens. Those are the same types of principles that we're trying to teach. But the first thing we have to do is prove to your listeners that they don't know how to travel safely abroad. And Cheryl, we will take you up on that uh, challenge a little bit later in this podcast. Listeners, we will take the uh, Depart Smart 10-question travel safety quiz. We'll see how well I do, and Cheryl can explain why they're asking each of those 10 questions. Before we move on, uh, Cheryl, you mentioned uh, Otto Warmbier. He is the American student uh, that was uh, taken prisoner in North Korea on a trip, and then he was uh, subsequently in a coma. Still mysterious how that happened. And when he returned... Uh, to the United States. He died shortly thereafter. We've covered on VoyageReport.com about uh, the Trump administration now banning most American citizens from traveling to North Korea. Uh, but you're right, whether you're traveling to North Korea or perhaps Cuba now, where there are uh, new restrictions, uh, it's very easy to buy the ticket or make the Airbnb reservations, uh, but not so easy to find out where uh, travel is banned or where you're prohibited as an American citizen uh, from going. Listeners, we're speaking with Cheryl Hill. She is the executive director and co-founder of Depart Smart. You can follow her on Twitter at Cheryl D, D as in darling, Hill, Cheryl D. Hill. And her organization is on Facebook and Twitter at Depart Smart Org, on LinkedIn at Depart-Smart, on Instagram at Depart.Smart, and on YouTube at Clear Cause Foundation. Now, Cheryl, why Clear Cause Foundation on YouTube? When we were 
When we first started our nonprofit, we were out to pass laws to protect students abroad because they are a vulnerable population. Our nonprofit's name was Clear Cause. In 2016, those same students came back to us and said, Mrs. Hill, you are not clear cause. You are depart smart, and my family needs to know this as much as we do. We want you to go wider, broader, and reach more. And so we we embraced that, and in 2016, we became depart smart, doing business as clear cause. But obviously, we don't want to lose the traction we've built with our YouTube channel. Absolutely. So, listeners, that's where you can find them, and uh, they also have videos uh, on their website and the course that we talked about, the travel safety course, 60 minutes. You want to check that out as well. Now, now, show you talk about being prepared by packing travel safety tools, such as a filtered water bottle, a first aid kit, a door lock, a smoke detector. <laughs> I've got to say, I don't think many people, when they're packing their shorts to Bermuda, are thinking about bringing filtered water bottles, first aid kits. Um, why do you suggest that? And what do you say to the people who say, you know what, we're never going to use this stuff. This is being way too paranoid. Oh, I love it. <laughs> I just, I can't tell you how many times I, I, I do book a lot with, on, with vacation homes. It's one of my favorite stays. I use Google Earth to check out up my street. So I actually use the satellite view and the street view to look up and down the street where I live. I got caught once when I didn't do that. I was in Turks and Caicos and there was a huge, I had a really great deal on this condo. It was a strikingly magnificent condo on the beach. And right next door to us was a human waste plant. And so every day, instead of waking up to the ocean air, we woke up to smell dairy air. And it was gross and not worth the discount on the stay that we had. So I've learned to, um, to take safety seriously, especially when I'm going to a third world country. At least four times when I've even traveled in the United States, I get to the, the housing and it could be a, uh, just a condo in a, you know, a high rise. And there's a key to the door. And there's no bolt to secure myself inside. So anyone who has that key can walk in on me while I'm sleeping. So I bring a safety lock or a door wedge. To, it's a little $5 thing that I can buy at the hardware store to put underneath the door so I can sleep soundly knowing nobody's walking in that door while I'm asleep. Fire safety is another big deal. We take it for granted here in the United States. But we were in, uh, we rented another home in Vieques, and there was no fire alarm, there was no fire extinguisher, and it was one of those homes, because of the high crime, that has bars on the windows, and you locked yourself into the house with a key. So if there was a fire, we would have to use a key to get out of the door. We wouldn't be able to get out of the windows because there were bars on our windows. And so I called to say, hey, there's no... Um, the, the oven wouldn't turn off. And I said, I'm concerned about uh, the, the security and the safety of this electric oven that won't turn off. And you don't have a fire alarm or an extinguisher, so you need to fix this problem. Well, they never fixed the problem, but I wasn't overly concerned because I carry a $5 portable battery-operated smoke alarm. And I stuck it you know, up on the wall. You pull a little tape off, you stick it up on the wall, and if something were to happen, we, un we ended up you, you couldn't unplug the stove because it was hardwired into the wall. And that's the other thing. Power standards in third world countries are very different than the United States. There was no fuse breaker. I know we could go on and on. Um, so you, only, you never get a second chance to make the right decision the first time. And I've learned from the hardest school of Knox that you can never be too prepared. So yes, I travel with a door wedge. I travel with a fire alarm. I've had to use both of those many times in my travels. I also travel with a life straw, it's 20 bucks. I have four of them at my house. Because in a situation like Puerto Rico right now where there is this hurricane and they've been without power, or if you look back in the day when um, Cabo was hit by the hurricane and there was no power, there's no running water, cholera, and people, we need water, right? We can survive without food, but you need water. And these life straws are $20 and you can, they clean out like 99% of the impurities. It's the coolest thing since sliced bread. So why wouldn't I travel with that? But those are devices 
the number one thing you should travel with are, is travel insurance. And seven out of 10 people don't buy it. Uh, when I ask people, they say, oh, I'm already insured. I'm like, yeah, I don't think so. Your health insurance is not going to evacuate you from your destination if you need emergency care. And the situation that just happened in Mexico with the bus, I really applaud the um, cruise ships for medical air ambulance evacuation of the people who needed it to the most reputable care in the United States uh, in that situation. That can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, and you never get a second chance to get the right health care in a timely and appropriate fashion. So there are lots of other cool tools that, you know, you might say we're way over the top, but we at home, we, we would never live in a house here in the United States without secure locks without fire safety and why would you do it when you go abroad and cheryl just for our listeners we are talking about the uh, bus crash in december where uh, there was a rollover uh, several passengers uh, were taking a cruise excursion i believe it was royal caribbean and there were 12 people killed at last count and uh, eight of those uh, being americans Um, now tell us again the dollar amount of the smoke detector that you carry with you everywhere you go how much is it I think you can get them for between five and ten bucks. Mine is battery operated. So five or ten dollars, and I think most people probably spend that in the airport on food or magazines or something as they're going. So something just like that uh, could come in very handy. Uh, let's take your ten question travel safety quiz. This is on your website. It's free for people to take. I'm going to take it right now on this podcast. We'll find out how prepared I am. Cheryl, you can correct me and school me um, as we go <laughs> through here. And I also want you to tell us on each question why you think it's so vitally important. So let's start here. And listeners, again, uh, this is on the Depart Smart website, departsmart.org. It's a 10-question travel safety quiz. Not only should you take it, uh, but I would highly recommend that uh, any of your loved ones going abroad take it as well. So question number one, do you read U.S. State Department country-specific safety information when planning a trip abroad? This I say absolutely, and this leads us to actually question number two, which is do you register your trip with the U.S. State Department? You're referring to the STEP program, the Smart Traveler Enrollment Program. Uh, This is actually our top tip for how to be safe when traveling abroad at voyagereport.com. You simply put in your passport number where you're going. It'll tell you the nearest U.S. Embassy, if there are multiple ones in the country, and you let them know where you're staying, your hotel or Airbnb, somewhere like that, and a phone number. This protects you in a couple of ways. First of all, you automatically get an email with a country-specific security alert or caution if any has been issued or advisory for that country. You'll get an email if one is issued before your trip as well. And if there is, God forbid, there is some sort of emergency, let's say a terrorist attack or natural disaster, hurricane, um, that way the State Department knows where you are if an evacuation is necessary. So Cheryl, I can be proud to say I always sign up and register my trip with the State Department, and that gives me that country-specific safety information you're talking about delivered right to my email. I can give you two examples of that particular tip is like having the U.S. consulate in your pocket. I was in Scotland. I registered my trip. I was on vacation, actually, with Tyler's girlfriend. We were trying to get a new lease on life, and my phone was going nuts, and I got a text from the State Department that said, Osama bin Laden has been killed. We do not know if there will be retaliation against Americans. We strongly advise you not to join in celebrations or crowds and uh, and to maintain a low profile. Of course, everywhere we went, they wanted to buy us a Guinness, and we joke about it now, but I would tell people I'm from Canada. You know, so we didn't want to attract attention. But, of course, um, it's hard not to when, when even your accent from Minnesota uh, pegs you as, a, as an American. Another time we were in Australia when the um, London riots were happening and the airport was kind of locked down. And we received a text that said, um, we see that you're booked to fly through London. We'd like to assist you and rebook you through Amsterdam, would this be acceptable to you? And so you get all kinds of help like that. There's also a really cool tip for your loved ones who might be a little concerned about you and they want those warnings too. If you're staying at home, you can register to follow your trip and receive the same warnings in advance. One of the important things I will say is that you, not your tour, 
should register your trip at the State Department. Otherwise, they will intercede and, and get your warnings before you do. And of course, in order to get that email, you need to have a communication plan that works at your destination country. An easy way to do that is to unlock your phone and buy a SIM card over there. Wonderful. I love all of those tips. Number three on your travel safety quiz, do you visit a travel clinic weeks before departure? Again, I'm going to be proud to say I do. I've gotten so many shots for so many things over the years because I travel so frequently um, that I'm, I'm pretty up to date. Some, of course, you have to know your country or region specific. Some parts of Africa, you have to carry with you your uh, yellow fever uh, vaccination card. Um, what else would you recommend for travel clinics? What I uh, what we strongly recommend, we have an entire micro lesson on this, is visiting the Centers for Disease Control. The third tab in is about traveling abroad and destinations, and it will give you very specific information about what could harm you there, such as uh, animals with rabies or uh, in waterborne illnesses. Um, we like to talk a lot about traveler's diarrhea. And if you go to a travel clinic, and the CDC will reinforce this, a travel clinic has a database of breakouts, um, of illness breakouts around the world. And so they're going to have a database versus a family doctor, right? So they are specialists in travel medicine. And a travel medicine specialist would be able to tell you what kind of breakouts have occurred, like cholera or uh, rotavirus, etc. The The cool thing that I love about knowing and having this skill is when I go to a travel clinic before I head south and traveler's diarrhea is a very common thing for United States citizens, they'll prep you with um, dehydration tablets to, so that you can rehydrate, you know, with um, the, the kind of uh, phosphates that you need to rehydrate um, if you have severe diarrhea, especially that's very important for um, young children. Um, traveler's diarrhea can be deadly for them. And even getting pre-meds so that if you get sick in a certain area, you can get, um, you can treat yourself without having to go seek out medical attention. I like the idea that I do have all of my medical information in my iPhone health app, which is a, a tip and trick we use in our course. Every iPhone has this app. It's called the health app. There is a section in it called medical ID. If someone, if you are unconscious and I used your phone to call 911 and you can do that by pushing the home button twice. If I did that and you used your health app with the medical ID, it would send an alert to your emergency contact with a pin that said Cheryl Hill is having an emergency and this is where she's at. So those are uh, tips and tricks to make travel awesome in life-saving ways. I go to the CDC first to check out what I might need and then I go visit my travel clinic for my pre-meds and preventives. And we have a whole travel health and safety section on voyagereport.com, listeners, so you can check that out as well. Number four, and uh, we might want to skip this one. Uh, do you buy travel, medical, and evacuation insurance? I'm going to be very honest. I don't always buy this insurance. Sometimes I feel as though I'm only in a country for two or three days, um, and I do get some protection from my credit card. Uh, some premium cards do offer it, but not always uh, for health. Um, so that is something I need to work on, Cheryl. I will be very honest. I'm a journalist. I can't lie. I have to tell the truth. Uh, mm -hmm. So I don't always do that. I need to get better at that. What do you suggest? Do you suggest uh, buying a policy uh, for each trip or even going through your airline? Or do you suggest what I've seen some people do, which is buy a yearly policy? It can be less than a dollar a day. I think that, um, and before we I answer that question, can I just make a clarity on the difference between trip insurance, which is what your credit card will cover, and travel medical insurance. Trip insurance is going to recover the cost of your purchase in case your flight was canceled because of a hurricane or a weather delay or whatever reason. Um, but travel insurance is going to protect you. And most often than not, there's no purchase you're going to make on your credit card unless you're maybe a titanium American Express card holder that is going to pay several hundred thousand dollars for medical evacuation if something happened to you and you had to be medically evacuated to, prim to primary specialty care. Here's an example. We had uh, a woman go through our course who had a personal safety plan and she was traveling to Belize. I love Belize. I love to scuba dive. Belize does not have hospital care on weekends. So if you're just traveling to Belize for a couple of days and you fall down some stairs and you have a critical head injury, there's no health care. 
you have got to take a medical evacuation flight to get to care. In this situation, there were two. The cost of the medical flights were $180,000. She had to prepay $50,000 to book the trip. She had the limits on her credit card, but her travel agents, her travel medical evacuation insurance, because of the 1-800 number and all the services that you're getting in case the terrible, awful thing happens, uh, took care of it for her. And that was one of the situations where she said, you saved my husband's life. And I responded, I didn't. You did because you had the tools and resources. This is never optional. You would never drive a car without having insurance. You would never live in a house that didn't have homeowner's insurance. And most of us understand the value proposition of healthcare, although today it's a lot less affordable than it used to be. Travel insurance, travel medical insurance, and you can buy annual plans. You also need to know what you're buying because there are exclusions that have to be considered. A lot of us like to drink a couple cocktails while we're watching the sunset. But in many cases, if you're inebriated, your travel insurance is null and void. If you zip line, if you parasail, if you cliff dive, those are all exclusions to your travel insurance. And so you have to have a plan on how you're going to get help at home. And even if you're in a socialist country where medical care is provided, if you're an expat, it probably doesn't apply to you. And they're going to want to see proof of your uh, in some countries. I think Greece would be a good example. You have to show evidence that you're insured when you arrive. Well, and even your uh, employer-provided health insurance uh, most times will not cover you in, in some other countries. Um, I have a goal of getting to every country in the world. I've only been to 61, so I have 130 to go. Um, but I remember when we went, uh, uh, when I was working at KSTP, the ABC affiliate in Minneapolis, and we went to Iraq and embedded with the U.S. military, uh, the station had to buy a special rider policy because our normal coverage uh, would not cover us because it was considered a war zone. So for those who are very adventurous going to whether it be Turkey, Iraq, Iran, you also want to look at making sure that whether there is uh, unrest, uh, that you're covered with whatever policy you buy as well. The other thing travel insurance can provide for you is legal support. A lot of countries have the Napoleon Law where you're guilty until proven innocent. So the bus driver in that accident in Mexico was arrested for causing harm. And so if you're traveling in a country where they arrest you, if you have an accident and someone is harmed, you need legal counsel immediately because getting your case to appear is not a priority. So legal counsel, translation services, and even concierge. I, the thing I love about travel insurance insurance, and I'm sure some trip insurance provides it too, is if I left my um, iPhone charger in the airport, I, oh gosh, I left my iPhone charger. They'll send me one that's compatible with the power in wow. the country that I'm visiting in. So there's those, the, the most important thing though, I think is really um, the the helpline, the 24 seven helpline to get to you and to help you get out. I, I never, and here's, here's a shocking statistic. The International Trade Association cited within the last couple of years that seven out of 10 people do not buy travel insurance. Nine out of 10 people do not visit a travel clinic. So you and I have some big work to do to get the word out to make sure people know how to depart smart. Absolutely. And just uh, another tool on our website, voyagereport.com, you can compare travel uh, policies to make sure that you're getting the fine print that you need for whatever destination you're going to. Number five, Cheryl, on your 10-question travel safety quiz in the U.S., the emergency phone number is 911. We're all taught that when we're kids. It is different, however, in most countries and can be separate numbers. For example, one number for fire, a different for ambulance and a third perhaps for police. The question, do you know the emergency numbers for your destination country? I'm proud to say not only uh, do I look that up before I go, but I also make sure that our contributors here at VoyageReport.com add that to our destination pages for the various destinations around the world. Uh, now, Cheryl, you mentioned at the very top about your own son, um, and you believe strongly that knowing the local emergency number could have made a difference. Is that correct? Yes. Tyler tried to dial 911. The number is 119 in Japan. But the next question is also relevant. And you're talking about number six. Could you ask for help and identify your location in the local language? Yes. Could you? I tried to know how to say hello, thank you, and 
help. Those are my three go-to words. Sometimes the language is extremely difficult, um, but I think that is a wonderful goal to have, and I try to do it as well. So a really cool tool that I love to tell people about, and I, I like to use free tools as much as possible, but we are all familiar with Google Translate on our laptops. But there is an app you can get for your phone, and you can type in or say, um, help, I need an ambulance, this address. And then when you need to call the service, you can you can see it or you can have it say it. And there's a lens, there is a camera lens on that app where I can hold my phone over a menu if I have, say, a shellfish allergy, and I can, it will translate on my screen uh, the text into English, which is very helpful um, for medical records, for an example. Even if Tyler would have been able to get through in Japan to emergency ambulance, he would not have been able to ask for help. And Cheryl, um, one of the things about uh, Google Translate that I also feel is extremely helpful um, is that you can download certain languages. Not all the languages that Google Translate covers, but the main ones, Spanish, French, etc. You can download that for offline use, so that's incredibly helpful. Uh, you talked about the camera option where you can hold up your phone's camera uh, to the printed text, and it will instantly translate it. I know, listeners, you're saying to yourself, if you've never used this, this is too good to be true. This sounds like Star Trek. This can't possibly be free, uh, but it is. I actually, funny enough, uh, in a lighter moment, had to use it to read a menu in Casablanca, Morocco. And I, it was a really well-reviewed restaurant, and everyone had recommended it, and I get there, and there's no English menu. Um, and so I tried it out for the first time ever. This was last year, and I use it for the menu, and it works as advertised. Now, of course, once in a while, there's the odd translation. Uh, it is a computer, obviously, uh, but I highly recommend it, along with Cheryl. The two other translators on my phone right now, are the app Translator, that's the name of it, and Say Hi. Those three are my favorite translation apps, but absolutely, uh, you can even, uh, Cheryl, you know, type in that phrase, I need help, I need an ambulance before you go, and it will save it in the app. I know Google Apps, uh, the Translate uh, app does this. You can save phrases. Uh, so that when something happens, you don't have to be fumbling as you're nervously trying to type. You can simply pull up the previous phrase that's been translated. Number yes. seven. Is your personal health information translated into the local language? Now, this one, I will be honest again, I have not translated my personal health information into the local language. I don't think I've ever done that. Um, in fact, I will admit, I don't even think I've thought to do that. Um, so why do you recommend that? When Tyler died in Japan, um, I received the terrible, awful phone call, and I was working frantically uh, with uh, the Japanese Red Cross Hospital to save his life. I had his medical records. I faxed them to the Japanese Red Cross Hospital. And on arrival, the doctor said to me, in Japanese, Japanese, please, no longly. And I saw my life end. So having your health information in the local language helps your care providers make informed decisions that could save your life. My son had type 1 diabetes and keeping his blood sugars well controlled um, is was paramount. He was stellar at it. He was a spokesperson and never had an issue with diabetes in his life with, with severe lows or highs until his death um, when he could not speak. So I am a, I personally have heart valve issues. I take metatopril. I use Google Translate to translate my health record. I put that in the iHealth app, and I have it with me in my emergency contacts, and my insurance company has it too. And once you have it, you can repurpose it again and again. It can also um, be a lifesaver here. But if you are in a foreign country and you have an allergy to anything, latex, penicillin, whatever it might be, and your care provider doesn't know that you've had a prior procedure, um, so they're a little, you know, anxious about putting you under, all those things can be life-saving seconds that can make it easy. And it's something you only have to do once, and then you can use it again and again. And it's so powerful, Cheryl, that you speak from experience, and, and I appreciate you relating that to our listeners. Number eight, 
on the 10 question travel safety quiz. Do your emergency contacts have power of attorney and active passports good for six months beyond the date of your return? Now, we've already talked about why your relatives, not just you, not just the people who are traveling, but why your relatives, your next of kin should have those active passports good for at least six months before the date of return. But tell us why we need to have emergency emergency contacts that have power of attorney. I do not do this. I have not done it. Um, why do I have to? You know, it, there have been some situations that we have been um, assistance to where adult students over 18 years of age uh, were critically injured in a foreign country. And the school especially parents of students, you need to be aware of FERPA and HIPAA laws. Those are American laws, but the university may shield um, parents in that situation. You should have, FERPA, if you have a power of attorney, you have a FERPA release because that person has given you the right to act on their behalf and you won't be denied access to your loved one when you're in a foreign country. And if you have a power, imagine this, you are critically injured in a foreign country. You're in a coma. You're going to be in a coma for weeks at a time. And now your bills need to be paid. You have uh, some executive orders that might need to be done. Your power of attorney can access your bank account. They can pay your bills. They can get you the help they need. And they can make decisions about your life and health. And they should know what your uh, preferences are in that situation. Nobody wants to think about it. But we prepare for the worst and we expect the best. Well, people don't want to prepare for it because they feel as though they might uh, jinx something and jinx the trip. And if they think about it, and of course, your point is that by the time you need it, it's too late to deal with. I had a situation of a young man who was walking um, in Japan. When people see the yellow light, it means hit the gas and you don't want to be in the crosswalk. This kid was hit by two cars. He flew up in the air, came down and the second car hit him. And he was, uh, he had flatlined. He was an emergency trauma. His mom flew bedside. The, the insurance company, many insurance companies have uh, loved one bedside assistance. So they flew her over to assist him. She had no power of attorney. Uh, she couldn't uh, get any help for him because the school would, couldn't work with her. So we helped her with the forms that she needed, but she had to go to an embassy, which meant that Osaka was, she was in Osaka, she was hours away from the embassy. So she had to take a day away from bedside assistance of her son to get the power of attorney notarized at an embassy because that's an American thing. So if you have a power of attorney, you only have to do it once for all your trips, right? As long as you keep the same power of attorney, you should be in a great position. But getting help when you need help is a good thing. Well, uh, Cheryl, uh, you've you've shamed me here. I definitely have to do that for someone who travels as much as I do. Um, uh, I know my relatives have uh, active passports good for six months, um, but uh, they don't have emergency uh, power of attorney for me, so I definitely have to rectify that. Number nine, do you know where the U.S. Embassy is and how to reach it? Um, I say yes, because I always want to walk by. Usually they're extremely grand buildings, especially in Europe, uh, although some are being rebuilt to be uh, modern-day fortresses like the one that's uh, opening now in London. Um, but one of the benefits of signing up for the State Department's smart travel enrollment program is that you have to choose uh, what embassy is nearest you. There's usually a drop-down menu if there's more than one embassy or consulate facility uh, in the country that you're going to. Um, so you would also want to find out, maybe Google Maps, uh, where exactly it is. Do you do that for every uh, trip as well, Cheryl? I always do that, especially because when um, if you have a loved one who dies abroad, you really need the embassy to run the red tape for you. Uh, we had a a really odd thing happened with Tyler. He was quite tall, uh, six foot two at 16 years old, and they had no um, caskets that supported his frame. And the um, the Japanese culture is to cremate, and I knew that that wasn't Tyler. We had had conversations about end of life. I mean, isn't that odd? Because he checked the box on his driver's license to be a donor. And I knew that wasn't his desire, so I didn't want him cremated. So the embassy was very, uh, very efficient in expediting a uh, casket to Tokyo from the United States on Delta Airlines. Delta was, was beautiful to us. And so um, I always want to know where the embassy is now because I know how much they helped us in, during the worst time of our life. I put the embassy in my cell phone 
even during some of the most traumatic things that happen, whether it's weather or civil unrest or, you know, uh, lots of crowds using the cell service, your cell phone can become useless. And so I like having the address so that at least I have a physical address and I can take a snapshot of the map and have it in my camera so I know how to find the embassy. But I use a really, really cool tool to map out my um, my trip and the embassy is always the first thing that I pen. Most of us use some type of navigation tool. And the tool I like to use is Google Maps. But there is a really cool Gmail facility that Google publishes called Google My Maps. And if you sign in with your Gmail and you create, like, uh, I'm going to use, for an example, we were in Vieques, and I wanted to drop a pen. Uh, there's no embassy in Vieques, obviously, because it's a United States territory. But I wanted to drop a pen on our um, home rental, on the grocery store, on the gas station, on the hospital, on the fire department, the police, on the bioluminescent bay, and the five restaurants where I wanted to eat. And then I saved the map, and I shared the map with my son and my husband who were traveling with me. And then when we were in Vieques, all I had to do was open up my Google Map app, select My Maps and Vieques, and then all I had to do was touch a pen to get directions. So convenient. Absolutely. In fact, you bring up one other uh, point that we should mention, and maybe this is question number 11 if you change your quiz to 11 questions. <laughs> um, but have you had the end-of-life conversation with your loved ones? And as you mentioned, it can be awkward. It can be uh, unexpected, especially when you have a young adult in the family. Um, but perhaps, Cheryl, would you recommend that conversation before your loved one goes overseas? Do you know, and I absolutely, I think um, we should have that conversations with our loved ones, whether they're going overseas or not. Um, in Tyler's case, he had checked the box on his driver's license. This is actually a, a really beautiful story in the end. And he came home very proud that he got his driver's license. And he was an A honor student. We had bought a used car for him. So there was lots of excitement around this rite of passage. And I looked at his license and I said, oh, you checked the box. And he said, yeah, it's kind of creepy, isn't it? And I said, what? He said that somebody else would use your body parts. And I said, why did you check the box then? And he said, mom, I want to know that somebody else lived better because I was here. Wow. And I said, that's a beautiful thing. And he said, what do you want them to do with your leftovers? And I said, I don't know. I don't think I'll care. Um, donate them to science, you know, cremate me. And he goes, no, mom, hot like hell. I'd never want to be cremated. And I says, well, then we want to be buried? And he goes, no, dark and wormy and buggy. I never want to be buried. So I knew that Tyler did not want to be cremated and that his preference, his will, was not to be buried. And that's a tough challenge when you have to make that decision. So what's left? And in the end, there was a beautiful um, mausoleum in our community that had just been built. And Tyler was the first person to be um, entombed in this mausoleum. About s probably two months after Tyler died, uh, we received a round mailing, and inside this round tube from Japan, it was from the eye clinic, was this beautiful photograph. Uh, it was a painting, an art rendition of something, and I thought, this is weird. And then there's this Japanese letter, and then it was translated into English. And Tyler had written, this was back, you know, 10 years ago, so MySpace preceded Facebook. And Tyler had written, the one place I most would like to see is Greece. And this Japanese recipient of Tyler's cornea wrote a letter to our family that said, your darkest, he said, my family, your darkest day is my brightest hour, your greatest grief, my joy. Because of the generosity of your loved one, I can paint again. I am a world-famous architectural artist, and my world went dark 10 years ago. Because of you, I have light, and I can paint again, and I create this for you. And it's it strikingly resembles a picture of Greece. So uh, we all checked the boxes on our driver's license, and we all know what our preference is. We actually bought... Um, our place is next to Tyler in the mausoleum. It's a conversation people don't like to have, but there is so much peace when you have answers to those tough questions. Thank you for sharing that story, uh, Cheryl. I mean, I think that uh, if that doesn't convince you to have that conversation, 
but I'm not sure else uh, what else would. But uh, that's a beautiful uh, story about how uh, your son has impacted and helped so many other lives as well. Uh, the final question on the 10 question travel safety quiz is do you store important documents, for example, passport, healthcare information, electronically? And this is a great tip, and I'm proud to say yes. I always take a picture of my passport and make sure that I can have it not only on my phone, but in email so that I can access it on whatever desktop I'm on. And then, of course, the healthcare information, whether it be your healthcare card, uh, your blood type, et cetera, uh, you want to have that not only, you've mentioned the health app already, Cheryl, but um, I also like to just take a picture of it and have it in my email so that I can uh, access that. Again, if my phone gets stolen, I can still access it from any desktop. Um, so storing important documents is something that I do, and uh, Cheryl, I'm sure you do as well. I do. I, d I don't do email because I also like to store my credit card information. <laughs> and the reason we do this is that um, if you lose your passport and you have an image of your passport, your consulate can express replacement of your passport quicker than if you didn't have an image of your passport. Even having a paper copy with you is better than not having uh, a duplicate. But I like having um, my credit cards in either iCloud or Dropbox in photos because if I lost my wallet, um, which just happened this week, by the way, and I needed to use a credit card number, I needed to cancel the credit card number, then I would um, have an image and I would be able to, to at least buy uh, food and shelter. Um, believe it or not, the number one cause for trauma evacuation, according to the World Health Organization, is stress and anxiety. And it usually has to do with that situation that, you know, we, we don't um, have the resources we need to get help if we if we're found, you know, without a wallet, for an example. So it's a it's an important little step to do. You should do that anyway, whether you're going abroad or not. Well, and uh, for the credit cards, uh, as long as you have an image of the back of it as well, don't forget to take a picture, listeners, of the back as well as the front, and you've got those handy numbers. Uh, when you lose your credit card, you don't exactly know who to call right away, so you're going to want to know that information. The other reason, Cheryl, that I like having an electronic picture of the passport in addition to everything you just mentioned is that in some countries, um, in many countries as a matter of fact, it's not required that you carry your passport on you, and I like leaving that in a safe place. And then if for some reason something happens while I'm walking around, I have an image that I can show authorities, but I don't always have to have it in my back pocket or somewhere on me where if I'm accosted, it may get stolen. But of course, everybody, listeners, do what you're comfortable with uh, and of course what the local laws call for. Uh, now, Cheryl, I am curious where this quiz came from. How did this all come about? We um, were working really hard to pass protective laws, uh, which has been a frustration on many fronts. And we created that database, I said, the Incomplete Illness Injury Student Abroad Death Report of hundreds of sad stories. And we asked people, what do you know now that you didn't know then that could have reversed the tragedy? And Tyler's story repeats often, his story repeats again and again. And these 10 questions kept coming up. You know, there are, um, if we look at causation, um, most of us don't know what a flag on a beach means. We don't know how to avoid rip currents. We don't know about, um, we, we assume OSHA standards for balconies and windows are to code. But these buildings in some countries are hundreds of years old. And in populations that are shorter uh, than United States citizens, um, you can lean out and never lean back. And even just knowing what side of the tracks to go on, right? So the tools and the course that we built, um, and I, I value the work that you do, we need many voices to change the behaviors of 80 million people in America and billions of people around the world to make safety a priority because it is not spoken of often enough in travel safety and nobody gets a warning before they buy or fly. Our course will help walk you through tools and resources you can use to create a personal safety plan. So you don't step into the wrong side of the tracks wherever you go. Somebody um, recently called me up and said, well, what about Minnesota? And I said, well, let me help you. In Minnesota, as you know, we have Lyme's disease. We have tick-borne Lyme's disease and sometimes encephalitis. In some lakes, we have brain-eating amoebas. We've, we lost two kids in a lake here in the Twin Cities. We have hemlock on our roadsides. Hemlock is very dangerous, poisonous, and you can die. You need to know what that looks like. We have tornadoes. We live in tornado alleys. And the siren does not mean lunch. 
It means take cover. And we have freezing cold weather where you don't want to be outside for longer than 10 minutes. In fact, we shut our schools down because it's dangerously cold and people lose their lives every year because they're intoxicated and they don't get into shelter. And there are parts of Minneapolis that you don't want to be in. You know, we know that what those are. Most of us would not venture out alone at night in North Minneapolis. You've been here. You know what I'm talking about. So no matter where you go in the world, your safety is a priority. You have to stop and think. Prepare for the worst and expect the best, and always depart smart. And Cheryl, we always love to leave people with uh, more tips that they can use while they're traveling. So I just want to go through a few um, that you have on your uh, website, and then we can talk briefly about those. You say to always uh, contact the state attorney general um, uh, before you sign up to send your loved one on a, a private or college program. Why would I want to contact the state attorney general? You know, and Tyler's lawsuit, um, and this was more directed really to parents. There are lots of student travel tours that are encouraging you to give your kids these opportunities of a lifetime. And there are no requirements for how they do that. So people can tell you, uh, people to people student ambassadors told us that they had a uh, golden safety record. And yet another student died uh, shortly before Tyler. And when Tyler died, the one of the instigators on in us filing the lawsuit is that they would not take down that they had a solid safety record. So you don't know the safety record of that organization. And if you're trusting your child and you want them to have, you know, a, a student exchange experience, and I'm a host mom of eight students for more than 12 years, Tyler signed us up to host a student two weeks before he died. So we actually had four foreign brothers uh, after his death. We believe in it. We think it's great. I know I'm a great host mom. Um, and I know I really trust uh, Youth for Understanding. And Betsy Kiefer was our area director. And together we made a formidable team of really creating wonderful experiences. But you don't know that about who's soliciting your kid and you need to do your homework. And it's a deep dive. And if you call the attorney general, you can find out if there's been complaints and you can find out about lawsuits against that organization. You also yes. suggest checking with the Better Business Bureau, um, as well as trying to get a hold of information about a university or college's compliance with the Clery Act student right to know security, police, and crime statistics on campus. Obviously, that would give you great insight into a program that is run by a university or a college, although you do also say that the school might not actually be the one running the program, that it could be a third party. Yes, it's true. Um, in the case of Kara Munn, this is the $40 million tick story. She was a high school being led abroad by a Hotchkiss program, and Robbie Thacker Dean lost his life in Costa Rica. He was a Swarthmore student. He was going abroad with the Duke University program, which was really the Organization of Tropical Studies. So they can they can sub out uh, to other parties. So it's really difficult to understand who is the person who's entrusted with your child, with your students' um, health and safety? The Cleary Act, by the way, is kind of a, I, I have yet to find one. So the Cleary Act mandates uh, reporting of illnesses, injuries, and deaths on college campuses. And if you look up your alma mater, like University of Minnesota Campus Security Report, it is mandated that they report how all those things. So you should usually get it within, you know, 18 months of the prior year. And there is a little tiny clause in that that says if you own and control the campus for study abroad, you have to report that too. But I can tell you in 10 years of my advocacy work, I've never seen anybody do it. So wow. I um, I can't say that the, the Cleary report. Um, here's, a, here's an interesting st statistic, and it's a traumatic one. Because we were tracking illnesses, injuries, and deaths of students abroad, we saw a pattern in students dying at John Cabot University in Rome, Italy. John Cabot University is an American university in Rome. They're incorporated in Delaware. So you, may, you get this false sense of security. The Overseas Security Advisory Council, which we recommend, this is a really big tip, if you're going abroad and you want to have a public-private perspective on health and safety in that country, you can search on an internet, just do an internet search for OSAC, O-S-A-C, the Overseas Security Advisory Council Crime Report 
for that country. So if you were going to Mexico, uh, there is a crime, um, there's a countrywide warning right now, and many of the states uh, are having, it's their worst year ever for intentional homicides and um, tainted alcohol, et cetera. But you can pull the OSAC Crime Report Mexico, and it will kind of give you a breakdown by uh, state like oh, um, Quintana Roo for the traffic safety of the bus accident that just happened. And it'll give you very specific information that will be an eye opener for you to kind of create your plan. So we use the OSAC crime report and travel hero safety training um, to kind of do that. The OSAC crime report said since like 2007, American citizens should avoid Campo de Fiori at night. American citizens have been targeted and even killed. Campo di Fiori is just across the bridge from John Cabot University, and six students have lost their lives over the years. So you start to see a repeat pattern when you report, right, which is why we like to have statistically meaningful data. The Forum on Education Abroad recently, I think in this summer, in a U.S. news report where, we are, where I was also quoted, said that students are more likely to die on American campuses than abroad. It was a report that they did with HTH Worldwide, who was one of the major insurers of study abroad programs. And the statistics stated 30 per 100,000 students die on American campuses, while 18 per 100,000 students die abroad. So I want to bring that home with meaning. Traffic accidents are a leading cause of death in America. Would you agree? I think that is borne out by the NTSB numbers. Right, 10 per 100,000. So what the Forum on Education Abroad basically told readers is that your child is almost twice as likely to die studying abroad than in a car accident and three times more likely to die earning a degree. Well, and that brings up another item that you have as a tip, which is to ask whether the university or college or company employs risk managers, multiple layers of insurance uh, for the study abroad program, as you've already talked about. Don't, don't assume that your health insurance is enough. And finally, Cheryl, uh, something that just seems so simple, and yet most of us probably don't think of, is to simply Google the name of the program that you're considering taking part in and adding the words lawsuit or injured, death, died, rape, fire, to see what results come back. Yes, exactly. I would say that um, people to people, student ambassadors, had eight presidential names on it. And I think that intimidated a lot of families because they thought they would be taking on the United States government. But I found out through our investigation that they never had the, the people to people international program sold the rights to the name to people to people student ambassadors, which was a for profit group traded as uh, NASDAQ as EPAX on NASDAQ, they went out of business at the end of 2016. But you don't really you have to do a deep dive to really end this is about the money. It's about the bottom line. For some organizations, it truly is about the experience. I can't say enough. I know some people have had not pleasant experiences with Youth for Understanding because I've gotten those too. And I would say that if you are ever in a situation where um, human, human trafficking comes into play, there are some soft rules around that. And I say soft because while no department of the United States has any jurisdiction over travel and tourism safety, the FBI has done a lot of great things on stopping human trafficking. It is a federal offense to engage in, uh, in child trafficking in a foreign country. You will, you will be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. And if you feel like you are being groomed or violated in any way that would be related to human trafficking, the FBI is your go-to. Cheryl Hill is the executive director of Depart Smart. You can follow her at Cheryl D, D as in Darling, Hill on Twitter, and the organization on Facebook and Twitter, Depart Smart Org, on LinkedIn at Depart Smart, on Instagram at Depart Smart, and on YouTube at Clear Cause Foundation. Cheryl, thanks so much for being on the Voyage Report podcast and sharing what may be life saving tips for travelers of any age and we certainly appreciate you sharing your very personal story as an inspiration to all of us who travel abroad well let me give a gift to your listeners i created a special code just for you 
If you would like to develop your skills and build your personal safety plan and uh, learn and achieve a travel safety certification, which we hope will be good for perks in the very near future, you can use this code, the letter U, the letter H, the letter E, the letter R, the number zero, Exclam- and the letter U and exclamation mark, it reads, you hero you with the O as a zero because we see the hero in you. Oh, my Always goodness, travel Cheryl. Thank yeah. you so much. That's very generous for you to give to our uh, listeners with the goal, of course, of being prepared, uh, departing smart, and saving lives. So thank you not only for that promo code, not only for sharing your tips and tricks with our listeners, but also for what you're doing and sharing your very personal story. Well, thank you for having us. Stay safe. Listeners, what steps do you take to stay safe while traveling? Will you use some of Cheryl's tips? Let us know by rating this podcast, giving us a review, and sharing it on social media. We have guests every week talking about travel news and trends, so be sure to subscribe to our podcast. We'd sure appreciate your review. It helps bring more awareness to our journalism and original content. And if you have an idea for future guests on our podcast, please reach out at voyagereport.com and let us know. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Mark Albert. Bon voyage. You've been listening to the Voyage Report podcast. Get the scoop on travel at voyagereport.com.